Thank you very much. Uh, Ember has been a, a brilliant find that we've had for British Gas. It's helped us no end to actually deliver what British Gas has been trying to do for years, which is actually help the customer, really. That's, uh, I know it's a bit of a corporate spiel type thing, but uh, that's what we've always purport to do. Uh, it's also quite an interesting uh, application that was actually framework that we've uh, really found to speed our development process that we've been hampered with for years and years. Uh, so who are we? We are the core tech team for British Gas. It's called Web Transformation. That's what we do. Uh, it's, uh, we do British Gas residential energy. So it's gas, electricity. We also do services. There's a BGB channel as well, and we also do a white label Sainsbury's Energy. Uh, we've got 300 plus static content pages. It's running out of CQ 5.4, if anyone knows it. It's a Java stack running on Sling and a JCR a repository. We've got 60 plus user journeys on the website. Now, user journey for the business side is a single page contact form that would be classified as a user journey for the business. Uh, we have 3.3 million registered customers, of which 80% are active. Uh, they come back to do your meter reads, you do your payments. So we've had 20,000 meter reads a day, 6,000 payments a day, around, and about 100,000 logins a day. Now you can do all sorts of stuff with your OAM account, uh, and 140,000 visits. So like static content pages, help and advice, how to put loft conversion, not, not loft conversion, loft uh, insulation, that type of stuff. So there's a lot of help and advice, that type of stuff. It's a big site. A lot of people use it. And in our old development process, we used to reuse, uh, it was a Java stack. So in 2014, right at the beginning of the year, a couple of us decided to actually start looking at what our current technology stack is. We've got uh, an old Java stack. It's been developed for five, six years on CQ 5.4. Again, 5.4. So now if you look at CQ 5.4, Adobe product, it's actually running at six. 0.0 at the moment. We've not upgraded that for the last eight years. 5.4 has now actually run out. We're not actually, it's not supported by Adobe. So we thought, about time to actually spruce up the website. Let's have a look at the current technology. We built everything in Sling. We put all of our functional journeys in Sling, running on CQ. It's been a total nightmare to maintain. It's slow. The product isn't slow, it's our development process is slow and we are very, very traditionally conservative. So for change and risk, we are way down there. We want no risk whatsoever for any of this type of stuff. So what was the actual challenge? That challenge was to actually move our people, our development process into the new age, into client side, into APIs, and to actually deliver faster because customers don't hang around. Development, you know, Developers don't hang around. The actual technology doesn't hang around. It keeps moving forward. Because of our conservative approach, we didn't actually upgrade CQ at all. We didn't even look at upgrading. It was too much of a problem to actually look at that. It's a project, two million pounds. Not going to do that. We'll just leave it on 5.4. Don't want the risk. We've convinced our bosses that we need to go forward. APIs, client side. Get the customer to run the brow in the browser. Let the browser take the load move it off our servers, reduce the server stack, save us money. So all these type of things that we've actually looking at for CQ, that we were doing in CQ, we're now scrapping. We're putting a thin layer of APIs on top of that. It's JSON, it's REST. And we started that journey last year in October. It took us about a year, a year and a half to actually convince anyone in our business to actually take this up. Luckily, my boss actually listened to me and actually went forward. Not that I'm saying it's my idea, but I am. Uh, so, CQ 5.4, it's running on Java JSPs on Sling. We've actually got an older stack on there as well, running in uh, Spring. Spring 2, I believe it is. So, you know, that's how conservative we are. Stagnant, over two million lines of code. It's easier to cut and paste the chunk of code than it is to actually write something that's actually going to run on a class that's already existing. It's a pain in the ass to maintain. 
let's leave the CMS for what CMS is, as CMS. Content management, that's all it's going to be. Functional pages, Ember, APIs. We're putting a bit of lipstick on that pig that we have. Uh, it's, uh, it's an API layer. It's using Apache CXF. We're using OAuth to actually do the authentication, authorization, sorry, not authentication, authorization. We're building a caching layer on the ETHAP, running on Recruiter, Recruiter and Memcache. So we're looking at new technologies that are out there now that is going to help us to actually deliver the, the challenges that an uh, API and a uh, client-side framework gives us. We're going to move off CQ 5.4. We're going to upgrade to AM6, latest version of CQ. Let the CMS do be a CMS. That's all it's going to be. Rich client, API-based technology. JSON, we've even taken on JSON uh, structures for the, some of the... Uh, for the responses to make sure that it's actually readable and actually usable and easy to transfer. And it's for our developers to make it more interesting, quick to turn around, see the results, ask for actually what the business want and we actually deliver it. It's taken us, what, two weeks, three weeks to actually deliver a journey now? Previously, if you had a journey that was delivered within six months, we were all happy. Obviously a million pounds, but that's a different kettle of fish. Uh, so that's the end of our uh, architecture bit. I'll go hand over to a, a developer now to talk why we chose Ember and not Angular. As everyone else was talking. Um, right, um, I'm Deepan. I'm the lead front-end solutions architect working for the digital team. Um, so my first job in this project was the most enviable of all is to choose a framework for us to use. Um, <laughs> I think going back to what Andy was saying earlier is like BG previously we had a really dreadful um, developer culture as in there was no real developer culture um, so we had a stack that was based on Java there was no real um, motivation sitting around in the developers there was a lack of communication between the developers and the actual guys who uh, the business so it didn't that any culture was non-existent, basically. So part of a job, as mentioned in the previous slide, was to make sure, um, yeah, you can choose all the right tools, you can choose all the frameworks, but then if you don't have a happy group of developers developing for you, then you're not going to make uh, much progress with it. So when we decided to move to the new um, architecture, which is basically a rich client architecture backed up by RESTful APIs, obviously the first question that comes into our mind is to choose the right framework for you. 2014 is probably a good time to be involved in the framework was because you probably have a framework coming out every night these days. Um, so dipping our feet into the framework was, um, it was a very interesting phase as we sat down to choose what framework we would use for British Gas. Um, we did an objective evaluation of the three most popular options, it's Backbone, Angular, and Ember. Backbone, we already had some experience because although BG was super conservative, we somehow managed to sneak in a few Backbone apps in there without the guys knowing that it was Backbone, but that's all right. Um, so we did have some experience on what Backbone was and what its um, positives were, what its uh, limitations were and things like that. Angular and Ember were on a completely different boat because it's the first real time we wanted, we were evaluating this frameworks for actual production use. Uh, we did take opinions. Um, we used at the, we looked at the usual um, parameters, uh, made sure it was a proper objective evaluation as opposed to being swayed away by things like popularity, um, things like that. Um, but what we did find is that although the process can be quite complicated in terms of which framework you choose, um, Selecting the right framework is actually made easy when you know what you want the framework to do. Because if you approach selecting one of these frameworks and trying to see what each of these frameworks offer and then try to make uh, your mind up on which one to use, you're going to probably going to find it a tough task. But then if you have a clear idea of what you want the framework to do for you in the short term, what do you want to do for, do for you in the long term, then it makes that task slightly more easier. One of the things we one of the things that influenced the decision was the mistakes we, or the lessons really, we learned from the past. What we introduced on the Java stack was really a very uh, 
a custom framework is what we introduced on the Java stack. Now the problem with that framework was that it had it, it left a lot of decisions for the developers to make. So lots of trivial decisions here and there were made by developers. The decisions made were not consistent. Basically, the framework left a lot for interpretation, basically. And what eventually happened over the over a period of uh, two, three years is that we found ourselves with a code base and design that was highly fragmented, as in because the framework itself did not define how something should be done. People said, oh, one developer thought, okay, maybe this is the right way of doing it, let's do it like that. Another person, same, sol same problem, different solution. And then eventually, what happens is you end up with uh, a design and architecture that's really fragmented, and your architecture is fragmented, you end up with, um, obviously, a fragmented code base. Um, we strongly believe that the framework a team uses highly influences the culture within the team. Now, this was something we still firmly believe because I think if a framework is promoting best practices, if a, prom if a framework is promoting good principles, then you start to use those principles outside of your use of the framework. So if your framework is pro promoting convention, if your framework is promoting consistency, so then you get to think along those angles in whatever thing you do. It's not just when you're building an app using that framework. It is when you make the decisions for the team, then you start thinking about those best practices, those principles that the framework is actually helping you uh, to do with. So in an area of constant churn, Ember's stability without stagnation approach really stood out for us. Now, I think stability without stagnation is a brilliant principle that Ember adopts. It's basically the ability to say that the framework is not going to stagnate. You're not you're not going, it's not like you're not going to be able to use any of the new features that come with the browser runtime. So you're going to be able to get to use those new features, but you're not going to have to change your code base every time or do a drastic rewrite of your code base every time you want to new, use a new feature. So stability without stagnation, the roadmap that Ember had, the process of RFCs that Ember implemented for making changes, the community around it. Now all these things were what eventually um, made us choose Ember over Angular in that particular um, framework war, really. Um, so why we chose Ember? Conventions baked into a solid MVVM model. Ignore convention and consistency advantages at your own peril. Now, this is something we learned the hard way with our previous stack. Um, as in, it is always easy to take uh, things like consistency, conventions, and all this, uh, and say, all right, you know what? We, could we do this pull requests, yeah, we, so the developers can review whether people are naming things the right way, we could do all that. And then you find over a period of time that's actually not true, because you would rather be uh, spending your time doing proper development of your apps rather than bothering about uh, what a particular controller is called, what a root is called. So uh, conventions baked into a solid MVM model, um, one of the best things we liked about Ember. Stability without stagnation, again, I think, what we've seen in the recent uh, months has further reinforced our belief in that principle, uh, especially around um, on the Ember Conf this year when they announced Glimmer, uh, which is um, quite a radical change to the Ember rendering uh, model, but then it works on the 1.x apps, so you don't actually have to do anything to update your app to work with Glimmer. So now those are the kind of things where we find Ember that always challenging itself, always wanting to improve, but also taking care of the developers who have massive apps um, built on the framework. So I'm always having that developer uh, taking care of its developers, basically. HTML bars, again, um, when we had handlebars originally, yeah. Handlebars, I think, I do like Ember, but I didn't really like handlebars when I started with it. Um, I found it, um, I found it too restrictive, but I was fine with that. But I couldn't live with bind ATTR and all those things. I think they just, uh, they did, did not seem, um, they did not seem natural to use. It always felt like you were having code in your uh, templates, basically, just so that the framework can do certain things. So they did put us off initially, but then, then came HTML bars, where you don't have to do it, especially with um, 1.11 rid of your bind ATT attacks if you have any. Um, so again, introduced without radical changes on the templates, always backward compatible. Um, 
easy to upgrade. You can upgrade incrementally as opposed to being scared of a greenfield full-fledged rewrite coming in five months, six months, whatever. So as, as a risky business, as a risk-aware business, I think these were things that, that really helped us convince our bosses, whatever, and, whatever Andy was saying previously. I'm sure a lot of British guys are still highly conservative. Uh, and they would say, oh, you know what, are you using this technology? Do you have to rewrite it next month? Well, no, because it allows us to, inc to um, change incrementally. Um, right balance of capability, sensible opinions defaults based on best practices. I think a lot of people find or feel that having a strong, for a framework to have a strong opinion is a wrong thing, but actually we feel the other way. I think it is always good uh, a framework has a sensible set of defaults, so, which basically means that whatever you're trying to do with the framework, you always have a starting point, as opposed to you having to try and figure out what the starting point for is. And Ember is really good in that regard. It always has a default way based on best practices to help you with that starting point. And then if you want to customize it or change that behavior, it gives you the flexibility to do it. So there's nothing wrong uh, with having s strong opinions as long as they're based on best practices, right balance of capability and sensible opinions, which means Ember would probably make a good politician. Um, reactive, pr reactive programming model. Well, reactive programming model with computed properties and observers. Obviously, Ember object, um, it uses the observable mixin and it provides you computed properties and um, observes out of the box, which is really good if you're building reactive applications. It helps you to get away from things like uh, monitoring the change event of something and then trying to do something once that event is triggered. It helps you to, uh, it helps you to uh, have a reactive implementation and really build reactive apps very easily using the concept of computed properties. Um, Ember CLI, Ember data, obvious reasons, but I should still say, Ember CLI uh, is really a game changer for Ember. Um, I think the features uh, you get with Ember CLI, obviously uh, it looks like a version is released every week. So uh, I, don't, I don't think Stefan Penner ever sleeps, but um, yeah, but I think the kind of uh, evolution, the rapid evolution and the, the way they listen to the community, the users of Ember CLI and how they implement new features is uh, brilliant. Clear roadmap, outstanding community. I think we looked at the process of how Ember actually goes about uh, change to its features. So whether the recent one was support for IE8 and IE9, which is currently something that um, Yehuda started at Thread recently to say whether should Ember support, drop support for IE8 and IE9. Really good approach to drop, push it to the community and find out what the community thinks about it and then see what is the best way for the framework to evolve instead of just saying, okay, this version is just gonna drop support for IE9, let's listen to the users, let's listen to the developers, and then figure out what the best way of doing it is. Clear roadmap, outstanding community, um, no questions about that. What we've done with Ember so far, um, we've made seriously good progress in the six months we've been using Ember. Um, traditionally, our, our applications, um, yeah, we, we usually try to make our customers' life as hard as possible. Um, so, but I think with, with the new transformation process, um, we've reevaluated those processes. We have a shiny new framework that allows us to realize the dreams. So we built three apps in the course of four months. Um, one of those apps is actually a bread and butter apps, which is the ability for a customer to get a quote for an energy product and buy the product all in the same app built using Ember. Um, since we released that app, we've seen a 25% increase in quote to sale conversion for our energy products, which is good news, keeps the bosses happy. Um, we've seen an 80% conversion in our homo uh, conversion rates. Well, it, homo retention has just gone up by 100%. I think previously customers were trying, we were trying to retain them, but just customers did not know how to retain themselves. So, um, so we made it absolutely clear in the new world that the UX process, the frameworks, they all go hand in hand and we can actually deliver a better uh, experience for our customers. So sleeker, quicker, and reactive web applications for our customers, which is what they're getting now. Um, we love add-ons. I think add-ons are one of the best um, things about Ember CLI. You have an impressive selection of add-ons available online. Um, create a custom comments add-on that holds modules common to all of our. Now this one was born out of the requirement that, now basically we, we have multiple apps at the moment. So our plan is not to develop one app that serves all our 
uh, functionality. So we want to have multiple apps basically. So one app for a customer getting a quote and a checkout, um, one app for a customer wanting to do a home move, one because I think it helps keep uh, the development and the maintenance of those apps easy as opposed to multiple project streams trying to change one big massive app. Um, so, but what happens when you build it with, build all those apps with Ember CLI, obviously, is that Ember CLI builds in all the core dependencies into each of those apps. So for example, things like the actual Ember, Ember framework itself, Ember data, um, all these frameworks gets built into individual apps. Um, and then if you go to that page, if you go, if you go to the quote app first, and then if you go to the homo app next, then what you're, what you're going to end up doing is actually download Ember twice, really, because uh, Ember has been built into uh, each of those apps. Now we wanted to stop that and say, okay, we wanted the core dependencies and the common modules to actually be served in one file, in one disk file that could sit on a C CDN somewhere, and then all apps could just reference that single file. So for, in order to do that, um, what we had to do was, um, So this is where I think uh, really the concept of Ember add-ons then the API that the Ember add-ons expose um, came into play. Now really we had to do three things. One is we wanted to stop uh, the app from actually building uh, the build process for the app from building the core dependencies into the app. Two, we wanted to build, we wanted to stop the add-ons, the common add-ons file, the common add-ons which we developed. We want to stop the add-on tree from being built into each app. And three, we wanted to insert a script tag that would actually allow um, the app to reference the common file which we host on a CDN. So the three, these three hooks that we've used here actually makes doing that pretty simple. For example, the content for hook, which um, as you might know, allows you to inject custom content into the app's index.html file. So you have multiple, uh, helpers basically, or multiple hooks that sit on an index.html file. So in this case, what we do is if we say if the environment is protection and if the hook's name is body, you just insert a script tag there, um, which will have the name of the file and it will also have the version of the file. The tree for hook, again, um, it's a hook that allows you to uh, customize what tree is being merged into the including app. So in this case, what we wanted to do was to stop the common add-ons from being merged into every app in vendor.js. So that's what this does. So it basically checks for if the environment is protection, then it basically returns a null uh, tree for the add-on. What this would do is basically stop your add-on tree from being built into each individual app because if they're common modules, you don't want them to be built into every app. You could do it within the common file which you deploy to your CDN. Um, and then finally, the included hook really to stop building the core dependencies. So in that case, we've specified an assets to exclude, which lists all the dependencies which we want uh, the build process to exclude, basically. So with that, with that approach, uh, we were able to stop, we were able to basically do what we want and actually host all the common dependencies in um, a single file that's hosted on a CDN, and then all apps could now include that file. I want to show you a quick demo, basically, of what we've done so far with um, right. So this is our quote app uh, that we built. We launched, I think, three about a month uh, and a half back. So single page application that allows you to get a quote and also buy your energy product online uses Ember data. Um, so you put in your postcode, put in your telephone number, select all your, um, your fuel type, your payment type. If you do not know your energy, you get asked a set of questions. Um, if you do know your energy consumption, you put in your values and you do get a code. And then you get the code table. Now this process, previously for a customer to do this, took about two minutes on the site. So just to give the customer a code, the experience took two minutes. And with this uh, new um, application, we were able to bring it down to just over 10 to 15 seconds on average, really. So we gave, we gave the customer really what they came to the site to look for. 
And then once, you, um, once you've got your quote, you can click the Buy Now button and optionally uh, send an email of the quote results. Again, all these things built using different routes in Ember. Uh, routes really are, yeah, one of the strong points of the Ember framework. It's got a really good router uh, for you to work with. So once you click Buy Now, you then get to choose your, fill in your details. And you do also have uh, you have a widget on the right hand side that actually tells you um, which sections you completed and which ones are valid. And if you choose to uh, change any of that information, you can actually click on edit. And that's not my real bank details, so <laughs> that's fine. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, so you click on small print. Don't read the terms and conditions. Um, you, and then if you want to edit, you go back to personal details. Um, you click place order, and then it helps you, the journey is done, basically. So previously, this step to getting from court and actually to completing the sale, it would take a customer on an average of three and a half minutes to do. And with the new one, we were able to uh, reduce the time by more than a half by building it as a single page um, application, basically. So. Yeah, so the add-on API provides great flexibility for authors. Um, I think it, it allows you to do some really good low-level customization um, on the add-on front. Um, challenges, pitfalls we encountered early on. We also have built a couple of custom add-ons, BG Deploy and CLI Test Recorder, which one of uh, which we will actually take you through later. Um, challenges, pitfalls we encountered early on. Now, this is something we really want to say because um, We've explored the good bits. So far, we found a lot of things that work really for us, really well for us, but we really wanted to also tell you what we found challenging when we started using Ember. Um, the learning curve early on and the documentation, I think the learning curve early on is still a problem, but there are different ways you can approach it. I think we've seen developers take different approaches to learning the framework, um, and each one with different levels of difficulty, really. Um, so. But I think personally, the best way to learn Ember is to really get rid of your biases and look at it with a fresh set of eyes, understand the principles, understand its core concepts, do not try and replicate something from another framework into Ember as a starter. Um, and then you will start understanding the core features. So once you understand the core features, the rest of it hangs together really well. But now we have version guides out on the web Ember website. You can go choose the version, the documents you want to see for 1.10. You can choose the documents you want to see for 1.11. Good progress being made on that front, and we're happy with that. Lack of a pattern library. This is something we found early on where we were trying to say, OK, now this, this to us seems like a very familiar problem. Is that a solution that someone else already has found for this particular problem? So it is a pattern, it's a tested solution library, basically, where you can go and say, OK, this is the problem you have. These are the ways you can actually approach solving that problem. Those solutions have been tested by the community, they've been used in production, so you can confidently use it that way. Lack of a pattern library, we did find it uh, a bit hard at the start. Not anymore with tools of the trade or docu.com. I think they, so docu had to have this, again, announced at the EmberConf. Um, they've announced this pattern library, basically. Um, we should hopefully solve that. Controller types and potential for fat controllers. So the first controller we wrote in Ember probably came to around 1,000 lines. I'll say, yeah. So I think the potential for fat controllers is that um, if you do not understand how to compose the elements of your application, then you can easily end up with fat controllers. So it's important you break down your app into proper components where required, into proper helpers where required, and then keep your uh, composition really good. Otherwise, you can end up with fat controllers. But we've done a few things from our side to make sure that certain mistakes that we made on that front do not happen again. Controller types, having controller, object controller, Array controller, item controller, not good. Um, easily confuses the hell out of people who are trying to understand what they're trying to do. Uh, good they're going with um, later versions of Ember. Happy about that. So those are some of the challenges and pitfalls we encountered early on. Now, I just pass on to Olivier to complete, um, give you some more information about what we had with polymorphism and forms, and then, yeah. 
Okay, hello guys. I'm actually Olivier. Hey, thank you for the welcome. <laughs> so, <laughs> so some of the challenges that we've actually experienced with Ember early on was like polymorphism in Ember data. I don't know if any of you actually looked at polymorphism in Ember, but you can only establish it when you have a, a relationship. So you have a parent model that has a child model and you can only establish polymorphism for the child model when we wanted it for the parent model. So again, Ember community is really, really good. So we had to Google it and then we found someone who had exactly the same issue and we were able to copy paste this code and put it in ours, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and now it, 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 it works great, but it's something that maybe we would have liked to see implemented from the beginning. Another issue is actually single page application design. Because what does single page application truly means? Us as developers, you know, as Ember gurus, we understand what it means, but the wider team doesn't always understand what a single page application is. For them, if you tell them single page application, well, they put the whole website on one page, you know, and the, the customer just have to scroll, which is not good enough. Um, how does Ember and the Ember community and the Ember documentation helps other people that are not like as tech savvy as we are? Well, I'm not that tech savvy, but I'm, uh, I bet you are, to sort of understand what a single page application truly is. Because, uh, yeah, leading to that, we can, we can, for example, forms is a true, true, and good example of this. Um, whatever we say, whatever we think, form are still really important to the way we, desi we design website in big enterprise because most enterprises will try to collect some data from the customers and then have the customers submit that data, which is really like um, HTML 2.0. You have this form element, which we're not using that much anymore, but we still rely on that design principles of having multiple inputs and then at the end of it, one button that said submit or uh, save or whatever and then some kind of validation. Um, I know some people don't like Angular in there, but what Angular has is actually the form uh, directive. So they, they have nice form validation. And what we've been trying to do here is actually say, hey, you know, we're Ember, Ember developers. We don't take a, a, a loss for an answer, yeah? We want to win the war against Angular. So let's make a better solution than what they have. And that's why we've started uh, building some components around forms, which I think you might be interested to have a look at. So um, I'll ask Gabor to, to join me maybe and take him through our implementation of forms. Yeah. Hello, I'm Gabor. Uh, as you told, I'm a front-end developer at British Gas. And uh, yeah, can we help me please? Okay, so uh, as Deepan mentioned and Olivia mentioned, uh, we work a lot with add-ons and uh, because we have several applications, uh, we have to use add-ons. It means we want to share all of the services, all of the, um, uh, all of the add-ons uh, between the uh, applications and uh, we had we faced in a problem with the forms uh, in Ember there is a really nice library the Ember validations which is really good for uh, determine if uh, if uh, any of a, of a property uh, fails on a validation rule it is really easy to set up a, a validation rule uh, you can create your own ones etc etc but what Olivier mentioned, uh, well, we had have an idea and uh, we started to implement it from Angular. So it means that some of the ideas comes from Angular. So um, we separated the concerns and uh, uh, we are developing currently a service, a proper service and a component which helps you 
Uh, one of them helps you in the form validation. It is a lightweight uh, validation, which based on the uh, Ember validation library. And the second one, the component, it, is, it, it just helps you to uh, set up your uh, display rules in a form. What I mean? Uh, as you saw in the previous uh, uh, application, the GetGoat application, um, we use Bootstrap. And uh, as we follow the Bootstrap conventions, um, we're using the arrow messages, and we have the uh, control icons at the inputs. The problem is, and maybe you found the situation, um, so the business sometimes not consistent. So it means that uh, the rules how to show and when uh, these arrow messages, arrow messages, it is different. So in one application, you have to show the arrow messages on key up DOM event. On another application, you have to show your messages on blur. Sometimes you have to find another, another problem only when it is uh, on error. Sorry. OK. Uh, and the goal was to create a service and a component which can be shared between the applications. And you can set up the, uh, the rules on application level. Uh, what it means? First of all, I'd like to introduce you. Uh, it is in Experimental, so it is not published yet. But uh, we are planning to publish it to the community. Uh, because obviously these two service, uh, the, the service and this component will help our life uh, in, the, in the future because we have to work a lot with forms. And uh, what I want to show you, okay, the form validation. Uh, here I set up two different forms. Uh, the reason is why I uh, make this demo with, with two forms because these two forms has the same properties. It has a first name as, and a last name. So just to be sure that uh, these are different instances. So as you see on the left side, it is the first uh, form, what I want to show you. Uh, this object, the user one object, comes from the controller. And uh, on the left side, you have the form. Um, we have the validation rules. It is the proper Ember validation rule. Uh, currently, we have just the presence uh, validating. And uh, what it does. Uh, as you see here on the right side, uh, after we use this service, on the user one object will be decorated by new properties, which is the user one the status first name valid, and of course the invalid, uh, user dollar status last name valid, and we have a user one dot valid, which uh, represents that uh, the whole uh, form is valid or not. Uh, why it is good, why we want to use it. We want it to have a portable object. It means that we have this user object and uh, it's sitting on the first controller. Uh, and in the journey when we, when we are transitioning to the next route, maybe on the next controller we want to uh, fetch this object. And uh, on that point uh, we want to know that it is valid, not valid, or we want to do anything as with that because we want to reuse this, uh, this object, but we don't want to persist it. So it is just in the memory. It is really good way because uh, from other controller, you can, you can reach this property from the previous controller. Nice. Uh, the really good here that these properties helps you in the template to manipulate, for example, uh, as everybody knows, in the form group class div, which is a wrapper for the input, uh, you can specify that you want to add the has error or not, depending on this property. It is available on your template. Um, and how it works? Because the presence is the only rule here. If I delete my name, as you saw, it automatically updates the, uh, the first name uh, validation, and the whole uh, form is, is invalid. Um, the second object it is re really similar to the first one. The only difference is that the last name is not specified when the page was loaded. And uh, so I just created it to check that the validation process runs uh, or not. And as we see here, 
it works properly. And as you see on the left side, at the first name, we have the minimum uh, three character length rule, which works properly. So it is the first one. It is a service. It comes from an Ember add-on. So if we create the NPM package, you just have to install it, and, uh, and this will work. Just to have a look at the current implementation, um, yeah. So it is experimental, as I told you. Um, you have to inject the service twice. The reason is because we want to have uh, two different instances. It is really important, otherwise you will overwrite uh, with the same property. So we had two forms. Both of them had the first name and the last name. And uh, if you have only one instance, the last one will override the first one. Uh, in the init section, in the init event, we create our, our object. We set up the user one property dynamically. And uh, the module helper has a create method. It is not the ember object create method. It is our custom one. It is just for the conventions. And currently, you uh, specify your properties, and now the validation is this way. But of course, this will come out, and uh, and uh, we will solve it another way. Why it is good? Uh, the service automatically generates you all of the all of the uh, rules what you passed, uh, and uh, and uh, these properties will be available on your template or anywhere you want. As you see here, one of the validation rules is imported from another file. It is really good because if you have a big form, for example, uh, you can hide it from your controller, so you can you can keep it clean. It is really good. In the second uh, object, I just passed it uh, uh, directly. Okay, so it is the service. Any questions about this service? Yes, no, no, no. Okay, okay. The second one, uh, it is a. The second one is a component. Uh, as I mentioned, the goal of this component to help you to specify when you want to show this icon, when you want to show the arrow message. For example, now this arrow message is shown only when you have a blur event. It was the requirement. But in other application, we have to use a different one. Previously, in the template, we, we created our uh, form validation helper and on every application we had to find out what is the rule when you use the uh, if condition in the template and that condition must be calculated on the controller so in your controller you had a lot of unnecessary code after this that is unnecessary because <coughs> what it does this idea came from angular uh, what it, it does exactly that uh, Okay, so the DOM uh, is based on bootstrap conventions. As you see here, we have a form group class. Inside that, as a wrapper, you have the label, you have your input, you have anything you want, it doesn't matter. Uh, this div, it is the uh, component I wish to show you. Uh, what it does, as you see, automatically it uh, added these classes. Now it is BG prefixed, so as I told you, experimental. Uh, and we use the same name as in Angular. The reason is because a lot of co uh, developers uh, come from Angular world. If you know what it does, you will know here as well. And uh, we came from the Angular world. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, inside this wrapper, inside this component, we use the component yield to replace uh, uh, the HTML, what you passed into that, so we use the block uh, convention. And what it does, if you have any of the uh, DOM events, it creates new classes. Maybe it is, I can. Is this one? Okay, so, so now we have two classes, the pristine and the untouched. It means that uh, the user didn't have any key up event. Or, or if it is a select, it, it is not changed, the select. Uh, the untouched mean it was not blurred yet. What's happening if the user click on this? It has the 
in focus. It is not from Angular, it is our idea. It can be helpful to describe uh, from other rules. Uh, if you start to change the value, it gets the value change class. And uh, the service stores the initial value. So if you set it up back, it removes that. It is really good because you can identify that the value in real changed or not. And if you leave this input, it gets the uh, touched. And uh, because I, I changed already the value, it is dirty now. Why it is good? Because after these classes are existing on the wrapper to specify, to specify the elements to, dis to be displayed, only on CSS Lava, on your application. So as you see here, it is less. Uh, as you see here, uh, the form control feedback icon, it is, it, these are the rules when it is dirty or in focus or touched. Uh, the alert message it is only when it has an error and it is touched already. And if you want to change this rule, feel free. So it is just in your application. Um, and I'd like to show you the template because the template is cleaner now. Okay. So we have, currently we use this name, but we will find out another name, the BG form form group. This is the um, component which creates this diff for you. Uh, you can add any other classes you want. And as you see here, the has error, it is added when the user status first name is invalid. And it is a way that how you can use the bootstrap convention because the has error is a bootstrap uh, class. After that, uh, you don't have to find out when you want to show this icon or the alert message. Pre previously, we used if conditions and that was calculated on controller. Now in the controller, nothing is there only in the CSS. So that's why I'm pretty sure that uh, this small component will help us in the, in the next uh, uh, implementations. So in outlines, it is the, uh, oh yes, and one more thing. As you see here, the user one arrows first name, it comes from the ember validation. So if you want to overwrite it, if you want to specify your own arrow message, you can do it in the ember validation <laughs> way. So. That's it. So we are planning to uh, publish it in the next few weeks. Uh, now this, uh, this demo application is available uh, in the GitHub. Uh, our group is called Connected Homes. So I don't know somehow we can, we can, we can, I don't know, just, uh, you know, let the guys know because now I yeah, yeah, something similar, please. Yeah, so on the Connected Homes, this application is available, and if somebody interested on that, uh, just raise an issue, just, uh, uh, just to know that you want to be, you know, notified that when it is done. So hopefully in the next week or in two, three weeks, uh, this will be available, I guess. So that's it, thank you. Um, I think it just we're just going to uh, wind this up really um, is that um, this is j just really to demonstrate what we've done with Ember so far um, the add-ons we plan to finish the add-ons we've done um, what we uh, what we found over at Ember where we would like Ember to improve as a framework um, so those were the slides that really we wanted to tell the community on what we've done with Ember so far now but now we have understood the nuances of the framework really um, we are going to flow the throttle now basically and build uh, more apps in the next few months um, I'm not going to bore you with slides anymore um, so <laughs> so I think um, we are going to build a fully interactive um, online account management app that allows our customers to come and manage their accounts online submit a read make a payment um, so it's going to be um, 
probably one of the biggest apps that we built. So we are excited and looking forward to that. And really the last thing was what Andy said early on. So if you um, looking to join the transformation that uh, we are doing at British Gas, you're welcome to uh, join us. There are more details on the slide pack, which um, we'll share anyways later on on who you want, who you have to contact if you want to be part of the transformation. Right. So thank you. is the actual workflow. So the actual, for example, that, the uh, get quote and sale, that was actually, it's, it is a single page application. So all the workflowing is actually done in the app. The way we actually move the API, so that, for example, there is data that needs to go, because it's all RESTful, we need the data to actually go into the back end and we can't allow someone to actually do a buy without actually getting a quote first. It's a legal requirement. And the data that you put in the front needs to then get passed to the actual order. So we create, when you do the quote, it actually comes back with a payload. So we use the payload, then we pass it through to the buy part of the journey. So the workflow, the actual management of the, of the data is still RESTful, but you're passing the information back and forth between the, the, between the APIs. You do need to know a bit of the actual information, how the flow goes from one page to another page. At the moment, there are APIs, we're not monetizing them. So we know what needs to go from one here to an here, but we've actually got wikis with, you know, we still create wikis, we still create APIs with documentation of the APIs. So, yes, there is a workflow. The workflow is based on the APIs, so data, but the actual front end is the main controller of that actual the way that gets step from one step to another step. So that's, that's a hard coded flow rather than an object that represents a flow that yeah. needs some sort of generic. No, no, we don't do any of that. There are some, uh, I think uh, Connected Homes do a lot of, which is the our Hive product. They do a lot of that, uh, and we. They also do a product called Smart Energy Report, which is also it's embedded into into British Gas. Uh, it was a handcrafted framework that someone built, and it's a, it, they were saying the guys were saying it's a total nightmare to maintain. And I can, I've looked at their code, and it's uh, it pulls back the actual. It makes a call. The API returns back a load of information on how the events work and what the next step is and how the pages work. So we don't do that. We actually let the the Ember guys, the front end guys, actually build that. That thing. We don't want to have some generic tool that suddenly does everything for you. Too hard to maintain. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, yeah. The um, how do you go about building that shared bundle of dependencies? That's those guys. <laughs> so the common stuff, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. The shared bundle of dependencies. Okay. So what we did was created a Ember CLI add-on, basically. So, um, show you on that. Right. So we created a um, an add-on called um, Ember Commons, basically. So the purpose of Commons is basically to hold common. Uh, modules, modules that are common between different applications. Now, as you can see here, uh, things like uh, an application adapter, helpers, um, and initializers, models that are common to uh, Ember data models, which are common to all of our apps or which are used by most of our apps, they're all uh, they all sit within this add-on called Ember Commons, basically. And then each of our apps basically specify Ember Commons as a dependency, and then all these modules get built into uh, the individual apps. So we basically made use of uh, an add-on basically to share common uh, modules and common uh, files between different apps. Now the only problem I, as I mentioned earlier was with that is that it gets built into every app. So although they're common, that code actually gets built into every app, which is what we're trying to avoid with this solution where uh, these things are actually built. The add-on basically is deployed. The output of the add-on is deployed out to a CDN and then all apps actually have a reference to the distribution uh, script file. 
that's to stop every app from downloading the same common modules and common dependencies repeatedly as customers move between different apps. Okay. We've actually, the, the use of the common uh, add-on, we've actually used it on static pages as well. So the header and the footer on our website at the moment for the, for the beta website is, uh, and this beta of content, is actually the header and footer are Ember apps, but they're Ember add-ons, and we just plug them into the static page on the website. So we're, uh, we're building up the way that in the old days it would have been a, a CQ component, which is server-side, and it rendered up server-side and each, you know, that's, that's the way it works. And then you ended up with a page that is anything that's functional, and the header and the footer is functional because it changes depending on whether you're logged in or not. Uh, that became a nightmare to maintain because in effect your entire site became dynamic, no caching. The beauty of this, client side, you can cache the JS, jobs are good. Just deploy it once, it's in the browser, you change change functions, so you change from logging to from logged out to logged in. You don't have to download a new page, it's there in the app, it's in the actual header. And we've created functional pages as functional journeys as well. So we've actually got a functional add-on that just plugs into a static page that does quoting for you in a in a static page. So we don't everything is not AJS. It's actually in scattered around the website. Mm -hmm. And if you're if you're working on one of these apps and you realise you want to make a change to one of those shared models, what's the workflow there? How do you feed that change back into that that add-on? At the moment, because we don't have versioning on those uh, on the commons add-on basically we found that uh, early on we found that it was a problem but now what we do is we version uh, we version the ember commons add-on basically and we create a release every time somebody makes a changes so we make sure that creating a new release ensures that apps that are not yet ready to use the new features that are now being introduced into commons can still work off an uh, old release while apps that are now uh, using the features that we've introduced newly into the commons model can actually latest, use the latest release. So we basically use the concept of releases to manage different versions. Um, that gives apps the flexibility to update or to use a specific release of the commons uh, plugin. Going forward, when where we are going to introduce this version where commons is just deployed as a distribution to a CDN, uh, we will probably relook at that process and see what's the best way of uh, doing that for that solution. Are you planning to open source commons as well, or the, the pans behind it? Well, at the moment, uh, the objects that sit within commons are probably not uh, useful anywhere outside of British Gas. We have a quote model and a tag model, which is probably not as exciting outside. But um, what we plan to do is components that we use that can actually be reused outside of the British Gas website, as in on any website, and which we think is um, going to be useful to the community. We will package them as separate add-ons and then share those. Um, add-ons with the community, like what we plan to do with the form, um, the form group and the form uh, components, which probably have much wider use outside of the Centric Average Gas website. Cool. Any more? I'd like say blueprint to create that first page of the add-on that makes it a separate JS file would be really useful. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's uh, the add-on API. We've done lots of um, research, exploration into it. Um, I think, yeah, Robert Jackson is available probably all the time uh, to talk to uh, any question he asks. I think I actually beat that record of what someone said 27 seconds. I think I got a response back from him in about 15 seconds. Um, but uh, yeah, he's always available to help. Uh, and I think the API is, like I said earlier, it allows you to really do low level customization so you can customize every bit of your app during the build process, which is what we really like about add-ons. So yeah, we will share any add-ons, any components we think are reusable, any patterns that we extract out of building these apps, we will make sure we share them with the community. All right, give it up. Yes.